Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? It's a uh, bracing and wet morning here in East Kent, England, United Kingdom, Europe, soon to be not in Europe, the world, the western spiral arm of the galaxy, the universe. Elon Musk has just shot his roadster into space aboard uh, Falcon, well it wasn't Falcon 9 was it, Falcon 9 is the single rocket with nine rockets in it, this is three Falcons strapped together, Falcon Heavy that's it, yeah, so it's 27 rockets basically, he's put uh, one of the very first electric cars aboard uh, one of the very first reusable rockets. So it's a history making week really. Although I've uh, you know I've spoken to the patients and said you know did you know have you seen the pictures of the sports car in orbit around the earth and they're like no because <laughs> it's not the news is you know the BBC and the, the sort of the mainstream media the broadcast media too busy covering antiques, auctions and uh, food programs and uh, real estate, people flipping real estate and that's all they cover you know and then in the evening you know for what passes for news they've decided that uh, covering actual news is too expensive so now they just do like human interest stories about someone who's got their son into a ballet school or something so uh, I've pretty well given up with uh, with that. So uh, you know nobody knows, and uh, this guy, <laughs> this is the most fantastic shot of the two first stage booster rockets landing in tandem on the launch pad where they just took off a few minutes earlier. And you ask if anyone's seen this historic shot. I mean. Uh, as historic, I would say, as man landing on the moon, and nobody's seen it. You know, there's no coverage of it. There's a bit of that they might have mentioned it, but they didn't show the picture of the rockets landing or anything. So, uh, just incredible. And I went out into the reception area of where we are, the main building, and I said to the couple of the staff working there, you know, did you know that there's a, a Tesla Roadster in orbit around the Earth at the moment? <laughs> And they're like, nah, get up, you know, all right, you know, it's not April the 1st, stop pulling my leg. I'm like, no, really, really, there is a, an electric sports car in orbit around the Earth <clears throat> with a little mini spaceman in it playing It's the Life on Mars by, uh, Dave, by Space Oddity by David Bowie. Uh, and they're live streaming it on YouTube. You can watch if you don't tune in. And they're like, yeah, okay, no, now I know you're joking, you know. <clears throat> so it's amazing how far removed people are really from what's going on, you know. <laughs> so talk about living in a bubble. I mean, most people have, I don't know, when you consider that we've got the internet now, we've got YouTube, we've got email and video on demand and, and people's horizons are not extending out. They're drawing in, you know, they're like, no, no, they didn't, only what happens on my desk is, is the only, my reality, you know, I don't care about electric roadsters in orbit, and yet they should, you know, they should, this is, we live in the future, some of us are living the future, some of us are just, uh, I don't know whether it's, uh, I mean, my favourite thing to blame for this is just, is education, you know, I, I say that, my generation probably was the last generation that had like a half decent education where you had to learn the capitals of the world and what the countries produced and uh, where they were on a globe and uh, and do some maths, some decent maths and uh, learn how to use the English language properly if only in writing, not in speaking but uh, and then of course all that was dropped, you know, it was all it was all stopped, everything was dumbed down as lowest common denominator type education came in 
and now what we're doing is we're seeing an entire generation that's the product of that, you know, which doesn't know, uh, doesn't know much about anything, or, or doesn't have a thirst for knowledge or a quest for knowledge, you know, they don't want to know much about anything. Uh, all they care about is the fact that they're they're finding it harder on a day-to-day -day basis to get by, and th but they can't understand why. They don't know why, um, which is sad. You know, it's not, like, we're almost returning to the, the class of serfs. Um, someone like uh, I mean, if you listen to Peter Schiff, um, Peter Schiff is um, an American political and financial economic commentator and he produces a video sort of two or three times a week and and turns it into an audio podcast which I is what I tend to listen to because he doesn't change <laughs> he's the same every time you look at him so you don't need to look at him for 20 minutes just to listen to what he's got to say but he's uh, He's, he's warning now that these these people, these happy people, or these unhappy people that are just sitting there, are you know don't really know what's going on in terms of uh, macroeconomics, the world economy, and stuff like that, and they're all about to get shafted big time. You know, <laughs> everyone, especially in America, America, which he calls like a, a fading superpower. You know, where. I've said for years that they mathematically they can't pay off their debt. They've been doomed for they've, they've been a dead nation walking for years on just based on the maths and um, not even on an opinion. You know, you, you could work this out with a slide rule. And uh, they're finally, you know, and then the trouble is that these doomsters are always predicting the end of the world. And then when the end of the world doesn't happen on the date that they predict, then um, they sort of move the date, <laughs> so you can't, you know, that, that's one type of doomster. Schiff is slightly different in that he has got quite a good internally consistent coherent model of what's going on that fits all the facts and, uh, you know, if you were to ask him a question he could explain it to you in a way that is, is logical, consistent and fits all the facts. Whereas his critics tend to concentrate on just sniping, sniping his arguments, and when he refutes their 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 uh, arguments, they they sort of don't say anything. They just jump onto the next thing, you know. <coughs> Schiff is completely wrong on Bitcoin. Having said that, I mean, what I'll do is I'll perhaps I'll put a link in the show notes to the. Uh, to his podcast because I do think or on his podcast because I do think it's really your you would be better off in terms of being prepared being educated and being sort of a bit savvy about world what's going on in the, in the world in the world context um, to, to keep an ear on someone like him and you say well you know what is the you know coming coming inflation in the US dollar got to do with you know, the price of an occlusal amalgam and the answer is you know surprisingly quite a lot you know, so what, you'd be amazed you know your <coughs> next time you go to borrow money from the bank or you know for if you want to sort of set wages and things like that these all treat these are all things that trickle down from macroeconomic policy so the rate that you're borrowing from your bank is very much determined by the sort of the London interbank rate, which in, in turn is determined by uh, the quantitative easing, which is you know how much the Bank of England inflates the money supply, and uh, the Bank of England is in a race with the Federal Reserve uh, and the Treasury in the United States to inflate, who are also inflating their money supply. And the European Central Bank and old Mario Draghi, who, uh, because the Germans had hyperinflation after the Second World War, the Germans and the Germans are pretty much the powerhouse in Europe. Very influential, and old uh, Angela Merkel, the Mutti mother, as they call her, she was very influential in uh, in Europe when, especially when you know it was realised that we were heading for the door, um, and so the Germans didn't want to inflate the money supply because they've seen they'd seen inflation you know they knew what it did inflation robs the 
the mob of its purchasing power and so the mob gets very angry and starts running around throwing stones through windows and stuff like that <coughs> and they didn't want that in Germany again and then had that between the wars it leads, leads to the rise of nationalistic right-wing parties you know and I think we could probably think of one nationalistic right-wing party that rose to power in the 1930s can't we in Germany that they probably wouldn't want to see back so so the ECB was very much more reluctant to print money uh, but, but reluctantly they had to join in because they can't um, you know it's a race to the bottom with currencies you have to if you're if someone's printing their currency and robbing their own citizens of their, their, their purchasing power by making each unit of the currency worth less because they're less scarce uh, then what happens is that their exports start getting extremely cheap uh, and so you're, you find it harder to sell into that country and easier to buy from them. So uh, your trade deficit gets worse. And so what you have to do is you, you have to be in lockstep. These, these large economic blocks have to march in step. Unfortunate analogy, but I mean, uh, that, is, that is the way it has to work. Because you can't allow another country to print money and not match it, at least in part. You know, you have to sort of make some sort of token effort to try and try and print a bit you know just so that they don't get too far away from you so anyway uh, Schiff has uh, been forecasting the, the, the you know the, the American apocalypse the he's a bit smarter than your average naysayer or doom in that he's um, you know he's you know, what they say now is they don't say what's oh, gonna happen in November they say well every day we're a day closer to it or they say something like uh, it's going to happen I know but nobody knows when nobody knows when and then they've got all these ways of you know trying to explain to people that things don't matter until they do you know they say well you like shift today said well you can you can be a lifelong smoker and people will tell you that smoking gives you lung cancer and you can say well that can't be true because I haven't got lung cancer and then one day you have got lung cancer. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like it doesn't happen until it does. So, uh, but the trouble is, because uh, Trump won't have any negative uh, press, you know, he wants he wants them. I mean, in a way, you know, being being a leader, he's, he's he's quite a good leader, I think, is Trump from a corporate point of view because he understands that the troops have to be upbeat they have to be positive nobody ever won a war with the troops that were sort of depressed <laughs> and, and ready to run away and didn't believe that they were going to win so uh, morale is, is a big thing with Trump and so he's, he goes around you know talking everything up and saying yeah everything's brilliant whereas um, which is a problem because when it isn't brilliant then he's at odds with the facts and uh, Schiff is very much in touch with the facts. He he does understand uh, movements, market movements, and stocks, and the stock market, and bond markets, and quantitative easing, money printing, and uh, and all this stuff. And explains it extremely simply. You know, you have to sort of listen to a few of his podcasts to get into what he's trying to say. But he says the same thing every time. He doesn't. He's not inconsistent. And. He's a bit like a guy who says, like, this This hotel is a death trap. It's it's a fire waiting to happen. And one day, the whole hotel's going to go up in flames and everyone's going to get killed or badly burned. And only a few people who've had the foresight to uh, put some sort of escape plan into effect are going to survive. And, um, <clears throat> you know, but nobody does anything. And so now, <clears throat> I think... Schiff thinks that he's seen the fire start. He's in the last week or so. What with the uh, two, uh, you know, the, the, there's been a, a thousand point drop on the Dow Jones, and then another thousand point drop on the Dow Jones, and you know, it's only a four percent drop. And some people would say, yeah, well, it was it was overdue a correction, you know. But he's saying, look, you know, you guys, there's there's a chip pan fire in the kitchen in this hotel. That's a, that's a disaster waiting to happen. And a fire is broken out in the kitchen. And you've got to leave now, you've got to leave. You've got to do something now. 
now. You know, it's, now is the time to panic. And Schiff is running around telling, saying like, you know, fire, fire, fire. And still no one's listening to him. He's getting so, he's getting so aerated. And it's, you know, I mean, in a way, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating to see this play out, you know, having said for so many years that mathematically the Americans uh, can't survive. That uh, they are, you know, that, that it all dates back to when Nixon took them off the gold standard in 1971. And, uh, and so the, the which, which gave the government a license to print as much money as they wanted. And of course, you know, and they could print money, and and they used to, um, they used to give it to countries in return for goods. Uh, China uh, was given a lot of dollars or dollar dollar denominated bonds and stuff like that in return for uh, running a trade uh, deficit with the with the Chinese for Chinese imported goods. And. There are lots of countries whose uh, currencies are basket cases, like Venezuela, where they're trying to like desperately get their hands on dollars. And so Schiff, who quite correctly points out that inflation is, is technically is the term that's applied to the printing of money. When you print, if you're a government and you print money, you're inflating the money supply, and that is inflation. But that's not what most people think of as inflation. Most people, when you talk to the average sort of bloke in the street about inflation. You're, you're talking about um, price inflation. That's what he thinks. That's what he calls inflation. If the price of his Tetley tea bags go up 10, 10 pence, then he, the, that's inflation. But <clears throat> that's not actually inflation. Infl the reason why his tea bags have gone up 10 pence is because the government has printed so much money that the purchasing power of money has just generally gone down because there's just more of it, you know, people, more, more people have got it and want to use it, spend it and get rid of it. And so, and so the people who make the tea say, I want, we're going to want some more of this stuff for our tea because uh, the cost of our producing our tea stayed the same, but the value of the money is going down. And so, so technically like the price of the tea has gone up. But it hasn't. The, t the price of the tea stayed the same. The value of the money's gone down. And I always say you can see this most in the housing market, where everybody says, "Oh yeah, I'm living in a house worth four hundred thousand pounds. I bought it for eighty, right? It's gone up three hundred twenty thousand. But it hasn't. It absolutely hasn't. The the value of the house is exactly the same. The house has stayed the same. <clears throat> it's the long time span that you live in a house that makes it apparent that the value, the purchasing power of your money has gone down, yeah? Because, I mean, tea bags, you know, you buy a, buy tea bags and then like two months later or a month later or a week later, you buy some more tea bags and, and the price is the same as it was last time and so you forget, don't you? Whereas a house, you might be in it for 20, 25, 30 years and you remember the purchase price. I mean, who remembers the purchase price of tea bags 30 years ago? I know you can look it up, but people don't carry it around in their head. But they do carry around the price of their house in their head. So they know, you know, and it's apparent to them. But then, then they immediately fall into the trap of saying, oh, look, I'm really wealthy, my house has gone up. Whereas in fact, you're not, you're less wealthy because your house is 30 years older. The roof is 30 years near, near a needing replacement. The, uh, <laughs> everything else is, is 30 years uh, older, you know. <clears throat> The windows are 30 years older. Actually, the house is worth less. So, in if you bought it for 85, say, in uh, you know 20 years ago, it's probably worth about 75. <laughs> and the fact that you can ask for 400,000 worthless pound notes for it is neither here nor there. Anyway, listen to Schiff. He's good. He's good, and he's he's not unentertaining either. But. Don't listen to him on Bitcoin. I, he's got, his ideas are wrong on Bitcoin, and uh, uh, because he's a big gold bug, and he really doesn't understand gold and, and Bitcoin. You know, he's he's mired in the old uh, sort of pre-industrial revolution view about you know where uh, you know the Roman view of gold as a store of value. And uh, <clears throat> I might uh, I might I might cover that tomorrow, but. Uh, at the risk of uh, turning these from dental talks into into global macroeconomic talks, but I find it fascinating the subject, and uh, and as I say, it's not irrelevant to dentistry. You know, we're all business people, 
we all need to know the business climate in which we're operating and uh, knowing which way the wind's blowing at, a, at an international level is the key to knowing which way the wind's going to be blowing at a national level which in turn is the key to knowing which way the wind's going to blow the next time your bank manager comes round and says he would like to have a little chat with you or you know you're going to stick in an application for a loan or something like that. Alright, nice to talk to you. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye.